and bar. There is always a lot of bad, pub bad publicity about Liverpool, and again, especially about Liverpool 8. Um, again, with it being the oldest black community in Europe, it was always targeted. We never had any identity, um, in, in a way. No one recognised us as being black Liverpoolians. You know, there was always a, a very low level of respect for us, shall I put it that way, um, and we were sort of all shoved into one area. When I was working in the 70s, just leading up in the 70s, uh, there was little or no opportunities for black people in the community, educationally, employment-wise. So, so we were suffering generational, generationally of um, lack of opportunity. And so you can only take so much, coupled with there was a heavy police, there were heavy police problems. They could just do what they wanted, it was out of control and no one ever questioned them. The police um, um, behaviour was very much aimed at the youth. All black youth were regarded as, as something of a, a problem. It was really an uncomfortable time for us. And at the same time, there were things happening in different parts of the country which were kind of setting the mood or the atmosphere. We kind of, I suppose we kind of got used to living in um, an atmosphere where basically the police did what they want. In those times, everywhere you went, police presence was was heavy and people were continually being stopped, searched, roughed up, sometimes planted with drugs, sometimes got accused of going quick. And whenever we used to like move from one place to another after dark, we used to do it collectively as a group of kids. Um, simply because if anything happened to you in the hands of the police, you had a witness. There was people getting snatched off the streets, taken in the vans, uh, beaten up, thrown out somewhere. Um, the police were raiding people's houses and there was money or property taken. I mean, just, just general stuff like that and you were just wondering in the game where it was going. I was with at the Met at the time and we were involved on a regular basis with issues and we, we I was chair of the community relations council so I used to meet with the police, we used to meet with the police to, to raise concerns. We would say about the issues in relation to the police action on the street, stopping young people, fitting them up. And, as, you know, and we said there's going to be problems. You knew something was in the air, but you didn't know what was in the air, if you get what I'm saying. You know what I mean? You know, there was little sporadic breakouts of little arguments with police and things like that, but I don't think anyone realised what was about to happen, to tell you the truth. There, there was a family in Liverpool who were constantly being harassed. I think everybody knows that that was the Cooper family. There was a man named Lester Cooper and he had four sons and on a, on a richly regular basis, you know, these guys would be walking the streets and they'd be constantly picked up. They'd be identified as belonging to the Cooper clan and they'd be constantly picked up and, 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 and put on false charges. My dad suffered a lot of <coughs> harassment in our like, teenage years as a result of our behaviour, but equally how the police then took his approach to complaining against them and taking the numbers and just always being ready to document the harassment. Even the father himself ended up being harassed when he was making complaints that he felt his family were being harassed. Um, and basically the incident that led to the riots kicking off um, was one early evening when one of the brothers was stopped on a motorbike um, by police and he was being questioned and one thing led to another and they were trying to arrest him. And it was happening outside the community centre as well, but there was quite a few black people in attendance. I think it was Wally Brown who came out. He was working at that particular community centre and he came out at the time and he tried to pacify things, but things just got out of hand. One of the lads, Chris Brown, said to me, Wally, come down, there's problems down the bottom of the So I went down there, there was four or five police vans. There's police everywhere and they had this guy, I'm not going to mention no name at this stage, but he's well known who it is, but he had him in, they had him in, in, in a... In a, in a, in a um, in the van. And so people started milling and shouting and begin to sort of throw some little bricks at the, at the police. And in this situation, the guy got away. And there was an arrest made, ironically, I think it was the other brother who was arrested and not the brother who was on the motorbike. And, um, and that basically sparked, you know, a, a, a pretty bad situation. As he resisted, uh, more and more young black people came to his assistance and more and more police came into the area and that's be, and, they, and then they brought in the um, the riot vans. Part of the urban myth that has grown up around uh, the riots and the start of the riots was that 
I was the person on the bike. I was not the person on the bike. I turned up in the crowd. You know, people were shouting, you know, do your job properly. The bike's not stolen. What are you going on with? And at some point, they'd already taken the driver, uh, the rider <coughs> into the van. And somebody, again, it wasn't me, opened the van door and the rider jumped out and disappeared into the crowd. And as the police kind of made a move towards like trying to grab hold of them, that was the moment where the crowd and the police kind of physically met. And by the end of it, you know, three or four policemen were injured. I was being held on the floor and suddenly in the background they heard sirens, people disappeared. The next thing I know, I'm in the van and I'm being taken off to the local police station. I remember arriving about 10 or 20 of us uh, going into Parliament Street and it was, it was only fairly minor then, it was only just a few bricks getting thrown. We came back to um, the office to warn the staff that you know, we needed to be out there because, you know, the lads were getting agitated and the police were all coming in in vans um, and it was starting to look like as though the area was being closed off. It was clear that things weren't settled down on a Friday. Things were wrong, things were good, things were, well, there was, there was action on the streets. I went to the Admiral Street Police Station to see the commander there to, to, to discuss what's going on, what they do, you know, because the police had these vans on the streets, which they didn't need to have on the streets. So what we were saying to them was that the police need to get these vans off the street. So while we were talking to the, to, to the commander, um, the chief constable came in, Kenneth Oxford. Now, he must have been to a dinner somewhere because he had a dinner jacket on and he was all dressed up. And he comes in the room and he says, says to the, says to the, chief, the, the um, officer, what's the problem? Now, it turns out that the, because there were so many police, the reason was, and this is what he said, this is what the, what, what the the, the guy who to do, actually said, it's the same problem, Chief. He said, um, the, there's been an over uh, reaction to the call out. So, what happened? There'd been a call that there was somebody on a motorbike. But apparently, where that incident was, was in, was in the, the, the intersection of two police areas. So, you get two, two responses from different areas. Plus, there's a traffic police also, but you're not far from where Panda School used to be. And they also reacted. So you got three reactions. That's why I had all these vans. So the police were admitting that they had a problem with our communications. Um, and what we then said to them, look, you need to get the vans off the street because if you get the vans off the street, kids will go home. That'll be the end of it. If you leave the vans on the street, you'll be trouble. A few friends of mine, and um, I heard about various people getting arrested and beaten by the police. So we'd come from a, a youth centre, which was the Methodist centre. And the next thing, um, a police uh, van pulled up and the uh, police jumped out all masked up. Imagine then the way he was dressed. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was frightening. It was like a futuristic with helmets and these long batons and they just started whacking out on us. I got it on the head, uh, knocked to the ground. And a few of my friends got knocked to the ground and we quickly realised that we had to defend ourselves. So in that state of mind, uh, we were forced to defend ourselves and that's when the onslaught began. I was watching the evening news and suddenly they announced that there were riots in talks with Liverpool. I then saw images coming onto my TV screen. That's when it, it starkly became real and I couldn't quite um, understand what was actually happening. I kind of remember seeing the same day the fringes of little things happen. It, it sort of spread like wildfire throughout the community and people just basically snapped. I can see bright, you know, like a bright glow like in the parliament streets above the rooftops. And I was a bit confused, it was clearly a fire, um, but I couldn't hear fire engines. Um, but as I was moving closer and closer, I could hear Voices getting louder and louder, and clearly there was a melee of some sort. There was some kind of trouble going on. And so I bypassed the friends one centre of the housing estate, and on the edge of the housing estate, separated from Parliament Street, there's an earth banking. And as I got closer and I started to mount the earth banking, I could just see the full drama of like a front line situation. I just I, I couldn't take in what was going on, and the first reaction was, I'm not too sure this should be going on. I thought this was like really heavy, you know. It was, this was our community. 
and there was just kind of like mad situation going on, the, the likes of which I've never seen before. On the sidelines, there were a number of community people running around, like what you have when a disaster's just happened. I remember there was a, pr a priest, there was a number of people from local community organisations, and there was a TV camera there, and people were running backwards and forwards, not really going anywhere, in a state of confusion. You can hear the noise from here, on Sapali. And that's why I said I better get down there and see what's happening, you know what I mean? And they had, well, I could ride on, you know what I mean? When the people arrived and got tired, maybe two, three in the morning, they went home. That's when the police started to, to do something, because now people are going home, no one's throwing any more bricks. The police now are trying to address people, and they're trying to arrest anybody to get their hands on it. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who, because a lot of people are watching, you know, not ever. Less people, more people were watching them actually were, were, were throwing bricks. The next day we found that people were in, were in, pre, were, were in police stations all over Merseyside. You know, people who I knew, mild young women, being charged with rioting. So it was nonsense. So that made people more, more angry for the second night. It first broke out by the Caribbean Centre, on the corner by the Caribbean Centre, with Parliament Street and Moonrake Street. At the time, there were some workmen had been doing some work in the area, so there was like a, a, a mobile. And I always remember um, people milling around messing around, and they set this on fire. They set this mobile on fire. I remember saying, listen, you better, you better get out, go because the police are going to be here, and they're going to be picking people up. When the police come, you couldn't, you couldn't do anything. Because when they come, People by then started attacking the police, and then they started barricading the barricading the, um, the junction, stopping cars, hijacking cars, turning them over. It became obvious after a while that the, the police couldn't do anything. The police were powerless; they couldn't they couldn't stop anything. We weren't going to be running anywhere anymore, so to speak. <laughs> As well, this is it. You're right on our territory now, and maybe a year or two ago, if if a jeep would have screeched up next to you, you would have been boom, you would have been driven away, but this wasn't happening, so people stood the ground, and uh, that's basically how it started. People group together, people form allegiances and alliances, and people have to have plans, because it was ordinary people against the authorities. Right, uh, you know, if it's broken down, if, if law and order is broken down that much, then that's what it's caused for people to organise themselves. There seem to be certain groups of um, people and individuals who were doing what they do, and I couldn't stop them. Nobody could stop them. That was their own free will of what they wanted to do. To me, it was a, a spontaneous reaction to uh, pressures that had been. Uh, leveled against uh, not just uh, me individually, but thousands of people had been, you know, uh, subdued to some form of oppression, you know, in, in, in that regard. So the, the reaction was what happened. We fought against the police, but then the mob, like the mob does, it just goes out of control and it takes everything in its path. They had a car rental on Parliament Street, you know, like Van Rettel Company, and um, they'd gone in there and brought vans out and everything kind of been, you know, destroyed them, but they'd used them as part of barricades and then, you know, like police vans. And then times, they didn't even have proper riot vans, they were just vans, innit, do you get what I'm saying? With all the windows smashed in and it was just mad. Buildings were ablaze, smoke, tyres, oil, everything was just um, unbelievable, really. Loads of police and they're getting it all a monkey chance and that. But I don't see them moving anyway, you know what I mean? See the kids lashing them with bricks, you know what I mean? And whatever they could get. And they, they was backing up and then they, some of them just threw the shields and got off, you know what I mean? These are the brave policemen, aren't they? They get paid danger money. You've got to imagine if you've got uh, a milk float on fire going at the police at 30 miles an hour. And going right into them. <laughs> it's it's it, it, it's a it's a pretty horrific uh, it's a pretty horrific scene. And uh, besides the bricks, the bottles, uh, the hatred, the atmosphere, uh, it, it was a violent situation. Put it this way, he did not want to be getting caught. 
by the police during that time. There's people who were driving him up from town, didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden they come down, especially down, down Grove Street, and they get hit with this barricade. So people were quickly turning around and getting away, frightened, you know. He was contained within uh, where the actual uh, fighting took place, which was the St. Nathaniel Estate and Upper Parliament. He was contained in the like, zone, a riot zone, and up, he had no way to move. So most people were trying to battle to get out of the situation not battle to stay there. If anything, the, it was, the, it was the, the fault of the Merseyside police that this riot escalated because of their overreaction uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the situation. That they actually then came with shields and armed up. So obviously you respond accordingly to that. I would say probably 80% of the people there, they had so much anger and it needed to be released. I mean, what, you know, it was the best to release it on the enemy as opposed to each other. People ran across the area, Liverpool Eight and beyond, were coming to sort of, I, 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 where I could see it, extract their own revenge on what they seen as the enemy. That's what was, we, we was classed as an enemy in some regard. And um, that's the way it was seen in the, in the locality. Back then, it really was a matter of life and death. The idea that there was supposed to be a legal process going on, you know, to kind of like restrain, you know, a fired up community and restore, you know, peace and calm again was like ridiculous. It was, it was really like a war situation. At one point there was a road digger which was being used to go into the, to, 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 to break the front line and literally just strike and, 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 and harm as many police officers as possible. Um, it may sound like a really a moral thing to say, but at the time, a lot of people didn't have any concern about what would be the consequences of something like that. I do have one image of um, a guy who was driving, I think it was a JCB, um, down up Parliament Street. He was just going up and down the pavements on this JCB with, with this pole sticking out the windscreen. And it, that was, uh, so people were just, um, it wasn't just aimed at the police because people all around were just diving out of the way. I remember what this night, I think, I'm not sure which night it was, but the police decided we're going to take control of this area before it starts. So what they did, the police evacuated all of Parliament Street. They, they cleared it. Remember, nobody's out at this stage. People just go out the business, there's nobody rioting. This is early, early, say six, five o'clock, six o'clock on the night. So they cleared the area, and they set up barricades by the Charles Button Centre. The police set themselves up with human barricades by the Charles Button Centre, by the Rialto, by the intersections of, of, of Mulgrave and Grove, so people couldn't get into those areas. Right? So that's how it, that, that was that. So we were in the Charles Button and the, the police got outside us. They were set that they're there, three or four deep, stopping people getting down. But of course nobody's out at that stage. How about when people started riding, started coming out, when it started getting dark now, people come out. Of course, they started throwing the bricks and things. The police that were started at the Charles Button Centre were pushed right back to past the Alto. They, they was worried at them time about the racket club and still fighting them by the Charles Button, you know what I mean? And so when, when, when the uh, rioters started to move, that's, that's when they, that's when they started. And they panicked, and they wanted, they wanted it. Yeah, they just wanted you not to go near that racket club. The front line was pushed right back down Parliament Street, very far and right up, very far up Parliament Street. I decided to go down with the Caribbean side, and a lot of guys ended up going up towards Lodge Lane. And subsequently, what happened from that was that Lodge Lane was razed to the ground and looted. Um, I stayed with the Caribbean centre half, and as we went down. Basically what happened as we headed down Parliament Street, we were making ground continually throughout the night and in the process, um, the Five Rackets Club was set ablaze and, 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 and looted. We got down as far as um, Catherine Street and Princess Road and the bank and the Rialto were set on fire exactly the same time. I didn't exactly see the start of the fire um, that, that brought the Rialto to the ground because I was too busy hanging around still outside of the Five Rackets Club. Well, I think they were deliberately targeted. 
and they were, were deliberately targeted because they were held in absolute contempt by the local community. I mean, the history of the Rialto going back to the 1930s and 40s, um, they, had, uh, they, they used to operate a colour bar um, and local black people couldn't use it, which is how Stanley House came into being and that was set up. Um, for black people to have a community centre. Um, and then more, more recently, um, in recent years, when Swain Bank took the Rialto over as a second-hand um, furniture warehouse, um, there was very, well, there was no evidence of black people working there, even though they were located within the heart of the community. Um, the Rackets Club stood for um, really everything that the community um, Aboard um, upper class people coming in to use the facilities of the community but giving nothing back. Yeah, they fought for that. You know what I mean? And once that's gone, that so, was it. And it must have hurt them. And then you bypassed the hospital what we so called trying to burn down, which wasn't true. And then there I also. And, and like Dave says, that they thought they fought there at the I also, but they thought there. Their eyes was going into town. There was no intention of going into town. If they wanted to go into town, they'd have well gone. You know what I mean? And they said that oh, if the reason why we had, we had to fight so hard to stop them going into town. No intention of going into town. Because you knew if you got into town, you never got out. Everybody knows about the time when um, the home that had the old people in it was being emptied out. Um, there was kind of like, you know, um, uh, there was kind of like a a bit of calm restored to, to allow um, the elderly people to be brought out of the home. It was the only time during the riots that we had a peace treaty. Uh, because what had happened is that obviously there was old women in the old women's home uh, and people had, had, had got in there etc. So it was decided that we asked the police to cease fire for, for a bit. People stopped completely and let the ambulances in and everything to get the old people out of the old people's home. So that all went on while the the, the younger people held back the police. It just showed uh, our humanity uh, that there was it wasn't just uh, as the, as the uh, chief constable described us uh, a gang of black hooligans. It, 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 it was people, you know, with black hooligans, everybody cares whether they're old, young, etc, etc. So that's when really we kind of epitomised who the war was with at that, at, that, at that particular time. While that was happening, um, things kind of calmed down a bit, and then remember the police front line um, moved right back. And so there was quite a gap between sort of like where the youths were and where the police were. And at that moment, I just saw a line a bright line come across the sky and something landed on the corner of Catherine Street. I wandered over towards it and as I was moving towards it, I didn't get a chance to get right on top of it so I could make out the details of what it was, but it was some sort of canister. It just kind of like made a small poof, but a lot of smoke started coming from it. And at that point, I realised it was a smoke bomb and suddenly the smoke caught me. And within a flash, my eyelids just started turning inside out, or that's how it felt, and my nose was just like running everywhere, there was tears streaming everywhere. And I mean, remember the burning feeling, the burning sensation of like bleach getting, getting in your eyes or your nose or something. We could smell it even though we lived in Englefield, because we lived directly behind Rialto. Um, and you could smell it in the air, I remember, you know, what, what, I won't say what his name, but he's a he's predominant young youth mentor but really good man now in the area. I remember him running in our block and we had a set of railings, which is the power station. So as you run in, you had to go that way or that way. And he run right into the railings because you couldn't see where he was. He had gas in his eyes, you know what I mean? And smashed his head in on the railings, you know. We had to pick him and drag him into the house. It's a matter of record that the police were firing CS canisters directly into the bodies um, of riot and youths. I saw um, somebody with the back blown out and somebody with the inside of their leg here blown out and there were actually 13 people shot with the canisters. I think the official figure was much less than that but I know there were 13 because we, because we dealt with them. If people don't understand these things the thing to be made clear about using canisters like that was, was that they were supposed to be fired on solid ground or a solid wall so that they'd explode and let off the smoke which was supposed to disperse the crowd 
but these things were being used like rubber bullets. We got in touch with um, somebody in the Daily Mirror and they told us that never on the mainland in Britain, except in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, had these um, types of CS gas canisters ever been fired. When finally they go out the next day, especially where we live, because we live behind the Rialto, as soon as you come out, you had the delicatessen and all the shops at the front, they were all gone, they were destroyed. The bank on the corner, the Nat West Bank, that's right by where we, where we lived you now, that was gone. <laughs> that was there, like, but it was a shell. The aftermath of it, the place really looked bad. I mean, there was no shops, there was only one or two shops. You know, you had maybe one or two little corner shops that were left, even some of the corner shops, our little corner shops, destroyed. Normally when you see like the toxic rights portrayed in the media, it's usually kind of like reported as like a single incident that happened over a number of days. But in actual fact, the riot itself was split into two separated events. Um, I remember that the first half of the riot was over three days in, in early July. And then there were a number of weeks, I think it was about two or three weeks, during which time Margaret Thatcher and William Whitelaw came to the city. And then towards the end of the month, when I was arrested during the riots, um, that was the most damaging part. A lot of the youth were arrested, uh, a lot of the youth were in Risley, uh, a lot of the youth were going through, through the courts. So we had a meeting at Stanley House and, and hence the Direct Defence Committee was formed. It just came from, from the people themselves, well we need to get these people out of jail, we need to get solicitors who are not friendly solicitors, who can be going to, to you know, for assistance. We never didn't have any... Um, chairperson, we didn't have a treasurer, there's no, there's no actual structure because everybody was a member of the Defence Committee. The place where people gathered was in the Charles Wheaton Centre. You know, they were letting us use their phones, it was a big ask on you know, an, an organisation and they let us use their basement. I was asked to come in and try to give some support to keep it, to keeping the Charles Wheaton um, organisation going. The Alec Defence were in there. The Defence Committee started to uh, find out exactly who had been arrested, where they were, liaised with the parents, uh, even went down and had a, had a demonstration outside the Risley, Risley Remand Centre. If you knew someone was arrested, you'd ring us and say, look, such a body's been arrested, I don't know what court they're in. And we'd go and sit in the court all day. We had court spotters and anyone could volunteer to be that. And all you did, you went in the court, took the name down, saw what they were thinking, if they were remanded, where they went to, what the next date in court was, who their solicitor was, and we did that to follow things up. During the situation, it's not, it's not happening in a cocoon, it's not happening in a vacuum. There's, there's, um, if you look at the press at the time, there's, there's uh, all kinds of press that about that, about these savages and, and all, all the press was, is, is going on about um, uh, how bad people are. And we, we have our own press people to, to actually try and rebalance that. There was clearly, um, you know, a lot of discussion going on during the interim about, you know, what had been coming out of the riots and some people, including myself, weren't happy about what had been going on um, and subsequently the riots kicked, flared up again more violently and definitely more organised. It became more organised in the sense of people were able to, to clearly see that the police tactics were so it became organised in that sense. It was disorganised in another sense because while somebody maybe was uh, breaking into the tyre place in the Parliament Street to get tyres, somebody was on a JCB in, in, in Grove Street and somebody was a Hanson's Dairies. So they were, it wasn't coordinated in the strict sense, but it was organised, if, if, if you could say disorganised organisation. I went through a number of experiences and I was arrested. I was arrested, I think it was the 27th or the 20th of July, and that was quite a violent affair. Um, everybody knew that to be arrested was not the done thing. You got the beaten of your life. Um, and I got that, I suffered that, I had to, I, I could barely walk after my beating. Certainly when Parliament Street went up in flames, when Lodge Lane was looted, um, when Granby Street went on fire, I mean, it really did dawn on you at that time that there was something really powerful going on. The vivid image of seeing kind of like flames going high up into the sky in your own community and the idea that, you know, we did this ourselves was a pretty powerful one. There was a looting going on um, 
and people just have like a free for all in, in that regard, um, which you know, which I can't say it's good or bad. It's just one of those things that happen. Um, we had to fight lads off with um, mops and brushes in the in the laundress. We were trying to get in to loot, break the laundress up. Well, the laundress was a community. These were community things that didn't need to be smashed to pieces. It wasn't what it was about. I think one of the things that never leaves you is the extent to which people on both sides of the front line, police and youths, were determined to hurt each other. I remember seeing um, Jimmy Phillips um, in a van, uh, in a police van. Someone said, Jimmy, you got Jimmy Phillips in a police van. When I went there, his teeth were mashed, the blood was hanging out of his face. They, they, they mashed him, the police had mashed him. And of course, there's no question that the, the violence from the, the, the rioters was, was, was bad, but men throwing bricks and petrol bombs. Um, but the police, you know, the police killed somebody. The police killed somebody. A young lad um, who was totally innocent of any crime whatsoever, and he was subject to, um, to death, basically, because he was killed. David Moore. It was a young white man who was murdered the day after I was arrested and I actually saw that happen. Um, I was on bail at the time and I saw that happen. And I will never ever forget that. And nobody ever talks about David Moore, but he was a true casualty of what happened. And I think if there was a memorial to him, it would be the ideal sort of like way to reflect on what happened in terms of the violence because he was mowed down by a police vehicle. And I say mowed down, I saw it with my own eyes. I'm, you know, that's no exaggeration. He was mowed down by the police. Every so often the police van would re rev up and come chasing down, chasing people in, in the police van, in, in the Land Rovers. And one night he did this and again, young man had a, had a bad leg, he couldn't run as fast as anybody else. Police killed him. They was just riding round and aiming at the rioters to disperse them. But obviously with him being disabled, he couldn't get out the way and it hit him and it dragged him. Subsequently, people were charged with death by dangerous driving, I, th I think the charge was. But obviously, in the, uh, the courts and the law, as it's seen, was, um, they were found uh, pronounced not guilty. Another occasion, police violence, another, another guy was uh, the police cornered him against the wall and pinned him against the wall, and then he nearly broke his back. If you treat somebody like a human being, then they won't rise. If you give them the same opportunities as the white man next to them, or the white woman next to them, then you don't feel that you are being oppressed in any way. So of course rights can be avoided, because you treat people equally. Um, you treat them for who they are, what they are, the gifts, talents, knowledge that they have. You do not oppress them. As the riots finished, of course, the government then started to, 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 to get involved. And Margaret Thatcher came to Liverpool. We saw her at the town hall. I mean, you know, we, we were told the situation. But she wouldn't, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have it. She wouldn't, she wouldn't listen. She just was um, saying, you can't, no, people can't write, you can't do that. The council had tried to get Thatcher down for months and months and months. So it's it what it goes to show the seriousness of what happened. She made it very clear that she wasn't going to do anything. She did actually then send up, um, her, created what was called the Minister for Merseyside, Michael Heseltine, um, and his secretary, um, a guy called Sorensen, actually spent several months in Liverpool. He thought that if you improve the physical environment, um, everything else would improve. He didn't address the essential issue was still uh, the relationship between the black youth in particular because of the likes of the sus laws and later the sas laws and the police. Recently we lost Father Austin Smith and at the time Michael Heseltine was drafted into Liverpool um, from uh, Margaret Thatcher's um, government to actually see um, the state of play because they'd stripped out a lot of resources to cities like Liverpool. And um, Michael Heseltine um, said um, to a meeting, um, uh, "You won't get anywhere rioting, or no one will, no one will, will, will support, you know, will, will look at you if you're rioting, or come near you if you're rioting." And what Austin said to him, "Well, you're here." 
So obviously they, <laughs> it did force them out of London to come to Liverpool. People ask me about the riots, I always say to them that I don't really know what the riot was about because I wasn't there. I didn't feel that anger or that rage when there's a thousand people standing beside you and there's you know a thousand policemen on the other side and I didn't actually experience that. For those people who did experience that, I can only presume it must have felt like one of these you know medieval war situations like Romans versus barbarians and the police are all there with the shields and people throwing whatever they're throwing you know but it must have been an intense experience. Toxteth South End that I remember the day I was arrested when I came out that was no longer there. <clears throat> Obviously it looked like a war so I lived in this community all my life and I watched this community break into pieces. Shops, businesses. I mean, what we look at now on the Liverpool Later is, is, is just a slim shadow of what it was. Um, as a local businessman, had I been a local businessman 30 something years ago, I would have been devastated if my life's businesses had just been looted and, um, you know, my livelihood was gone. I mean, when you look back at that, this is the crown shame, really, isn't it? Because, you know, everywhere got destroyed. Do you know what I mean? Um, which, to be quite honest with you, even if I reflect on it as 30 years, I, most of what was destroyed hasn't even been replaced. It was like waking up into a nightmare. So, it, it, if you thought it was bad before, suddenly to come home and find yourself in the, the wreckage and the bomb down and the burnt out and it all, it was just like coming into a bigger nightmare. It left a lot of desolation, but uh, desolation. But the other thing, it gave spirit back to people to actually say is that um, the government had to take notice. Central government could no longer strip away the resources it had done and um, from that community. I think it just made me realise that you have to stand up against things that are wrong, no matter what. Um, and it gave me great admiration for my own community and my own, you know, who I am as a Liverpool born black because it took great, great courage. What it did do is again, is it, it, it put Liverpool 8 on, on the map in regards to people knew then now that, well, we can't mess with them because they, they are going to stand up for themselves and they are prepared to go to those lengths to defend themselves. Amongst my friends, there was a certain sense of, yeah, we've shown them a certain sense of empowerment which was obviously for us a good thing after you know years and years of being oppressed. But now with hindsight, I think I can say that yeah, basically we smashed our own home. And if you were to see, if you were to be at home and you saw your neighbours suddenly freak out and smash their own home, you know that there was definitely something wrong in that home. We, we, we lost them all, we were at it at the time, hair saying. You know, she's an older woman, do you know what I mean? Look what you have done. You know, she was like, you know, a big old woman. She, she just looked at it as it was disgraceful behaviour, you know what I mean? You know, people carried on like animals. Well, maybe we did, you know what I mean? That's, you know, but I could understand it from her generation, looking at it, you know, look, just haven't done no good for yourselves. What did you end up doing? Destroying your own area. And she was completely right, you know what I mean? A lot of the elders were saying it at the time, do you know what I mean? And a lot of us younger ones couldn't see it. But of course you don't do it in rage, in anger. These are the things that happen. We took back power. We marched, and I think one of the marches against Ken Oxford, who was the chief constable at the time, and we would say one of the most racist police officers I've come across. Um, uh, what we galvanised was not just the black community, but people from all over the city marched against the oppression of the police with us. And so it actually started to um, reawake um, what was actually happening in our communities. Uh, so you had trade unionists, etc., marching with us. So politically, it, it woke us up to actually say, we don't have to put up with this. We do not have to stand for this police brutality, this police harassment. We will do something about it. This is um, a poem that I'd written uh, many years ago after the riots and it, 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 it just says a few things and uh, make of it what you will. 
But here goes, it's called Fiore Across the Mersey. This is the place where the riots had been. This is the area where the media screened. This is the place the council decreed CPOs and Alison schemes. Yet this is the place power coaches deem. This is the place the riots had been. This was the place of the garden team and police intoxicated with the riot shields. And we were angry, young in our teens, the final showdown up a Parliament Street. So they called up the Bishop and invited the Queen. The Pope and the Prime Minister all viewed the scene. Tarzan was invited, strawberries and cream. Then the fat cats and dignities all bowed to their scheme. Meanwhile in Toxted they landscaped in trees. Monkey business and employment promises, that's all it's been. Action Zone 8, where the riots have been. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>